for this hearing today. And um, I, first of all, I just want to have a, a, a little ground rules first. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to put their cell phones away. That means counselors, too. It doesn't work, but I try every time. Um, the other thing is, if anyone is going to speak, would you stand now and take the pledge? Swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you very much. So, um, welcome, Judge Ellis. Nice to have you back. Nice. You belong. <laughs> um, I will start with, um, first of all, reading a letter from the governor. And the governor reads, Dear Counselors, I am pleased to nominate Sarah Wayland Ellis to the position of Associate Justice of the Superior Court. I submit the nomination for the advice and consent of the Executive Council pursuant to Part 2, Chapter 2 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I am enclosing the nominee's resume for your convenience. So I welcome you. And before I have you introduce everyone that's here, I'm going to introduce my colleagues. Um, first, uh, Councilor Hurley, Councilor DiPaolo, Councilor Kennedy, and Councilor Duff. That's who is attending. Now, you can tell us, everybody here attending. My pleasure. Uh, thank you so much, Councillor Devaney, for hosting this meeting and to the councillors for being here. Uh, I'm joined today by one of my witnesses and my dear friend, uh, Maya Saraf Frain, another witness uh, and someone I have the pleasure of working with in the Waltham District Court, Probation Officer Daisy Barbosa, uh, my third witness, who may be my first witness, uh, and my mentor judge, uh, Judge Stacy Fortz. Sarah Adamson, uh, who became a good friend of mine in the administrative office of the district court. My father, John Wayland. My daughter, uh, Chloe Ellis. My son, Do my husband, uh, Don. <laughs> <laughs> my mother, Marilyn Wayland. Uh, uh, retired Sergeant Detective Stephen Fournier, who was for years the police prosecutor in the Waltham District Court, who I had occasion to work with when I was a new DA uh, up through when I was a judge and he retired. Um, behind Councillor Hurley, we have Detective David Savoy, who is the current Waltham District Court police prosecutor. We're joined by Waltham Assistant Chief Court Officer, Mark Mitchell, uh, who in many ways uh, is the glue of our courthouse. Uh, I'm joined by Joe Jackson, who is the DCA for the District Court, uh, by Sergeant Detective Dean, who's our former prosecutor in Waltham District Court and has moved on to other accomplishments. And uh, we're joined by Joseph uh, Dickhoff, Justice of the Appeals Court. Uh, and I'm sorry, I don't know this gentleman here, but we're also joined by Aaron Thomas, who has the uh, important role today of uh, memorializing these proceedings. So thank you. Thank you. Um, no, it's such a pleasure to see the judges that I voted for. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, the first, um, I'm calling your witnesses is the order that you've given me. And the first one is the Honorable Stacy Fortes. Welcome back. Thank you, Councillor Devaney. Would you like me to sit here? Yes, please. So let me start off by saying that I am uh, truly honored to be uh, before all of you, but deeply honored to be here in support of this uh, nominee. I have had the pleasure of working with Judge Sarah Ellis for the past eight years now uh, in a variety of capacities. Um, first, introduced to her in 2014 when she was Deputy Legal Counsel uh, and Director of Legal Policy for the Administrative Office of the District Court for Chief uh, Justice uh, Dolly. Um, I had an opportunity to work with her, observe her during uh, many uh, judicial trainings for judges uh, that she helped to put on during our annual judicial conference. Um, she would provide updates and give advice to judges on the law on a regular basis. But I really got to spend some time with her when um, she was assigned to work with the criminal committee of the district court uh, for which I was a member. And the district court uh, criminal uh, proceedings committee was responsible for a variety of things. Updating the jury instructions, 
working on um, forms, uh, pretrial condition forms, model plea colloquies. So I had an opportunity to work closely with Sarah and all of those things, um, as well as other committee members. One of the things that I discovered immediately um, when she was a lawyer assigned to the administrative office, um, and I think that every colleague would tell you now about her, is she is one of the smartest, most thoughtful judges that we have uh, in the district court. Um, and I think every judge, um, no matter their level of experience, judges who have been on the bench for a long time would say that um, she is a valuable resource to all of us. Um, I've had an opportunity to work with her as the regional administrative judge. When she was appointed, we were all thrilled to the district court. I was particularly thrilled when Chief Justice Dolly assigned her to sit in the region for which I'm responsible for administrating. As she mentioned in her remarks, and Chief Justice Dolly also called and asked if I'd be her mentor when she was appointed uh, as a judge. It is the easiest assignment he has ever given me. Um, I tease her and tell her that often I would just call and say everything okay and that would be the extent of the uh, advice that I would give her. She has been uh, a fabulous judge in the district court. She has worked in every court in the region. Um, many of you are familiar with some of the courts in the region for which I'm responsible. Lowell and Lawrence being some of the busiest courts in the region. She sat in those courts, handled jury trials, uh, bench trials, motions to suppress, you name it. Um, she uh, most recently was assigned to sit in the Waltham District Court, uh, where she sat with um, the late Greg Flynn, a beloved colleague uh, for all of us. Um, I think one of the things that really speaks to who she is as a person is that when Judge Flynn was diagnosed uh, with cancer and undergoing treatment, I called him and I asked him, what can we do for you? Um, and he said, there's only one thing, Stacy. Please keep Sarah Ellis as the second judge in the Waltham District Court. And for those of you who've worked with Greg Flynn, there are a couple things that we all came to know about him. He was an excellent judge, and he cared deeply for the community uh, of Waltham uh, and, and for those that the court served. So it said a lot uh, that he chose Sarah to, to be in the court with him while he was undergoing his treatment. Uh, when he retired in December, um, and Chief Justice Dolly was going to appoint another first justice, he also uh, fully supported uh, Sarah uh, as the first justice of the Waltham District Court, and she's done a tremendous job there. Um, we've all experienced a lot of challenges during the pandemic in keeping the courts running and justice being administered um, the way it should be. And she's done an outstanding job there. Um, I have mixed feelings about her appointment. I think we all do. Chief Justice Dolly said last week in a conversation that I had with him that we're all very proud and excited for her but the Superior Court's uh, gain will be a tremendous loss to the District Court. Um, she will go to Superior Court, I think, as a mentor for other judges um, in the Superior Court. And I'm happy to be here. Great. Thank you very much. Your testimony means a great deal to us. And thank you for your service. Um, anyone have any questions? Councilor Kennedy. I just, I just want to um, appreciate the fact that you mentioned Judge Flynn. He was somebody that I was fond of who I uh, had a lot of respect for. He was a good and decent uh, man. When he passed away, I didn't know his family, of course, but I knew how close uh, Judge Ellis was to him. So she was the person I called to offer condolences because he, I appeared in front of him since the day that he was appointed. And he was on a long time. He was just a very decent man. and. I'm sure if he uh, if he were alive today, he'd be sitting next to you, ready to uh, uh, pick us all up to make sure we vote for her. Thank you, Councilor Kelly. Any other councilors have any questions? Well, I thank you and um, proud vote right there. I really am. You made made us made us all proud. Um, the next witness is Probation Officer Daisy Babosa, and did I pronounce that correctly? It's pronounced Daisy. Okay, Daisy. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. 
Good afternoon and thank you for having me today. <clears throat> As you all may already know, my name is Probation Officer Daisy Barboza. Um, currently, I am a probation officer over at Waltham District Court, uh, where I had my first encounter with Judge Ellis three years ago, uh, who, where she sat um, on my interview panel. Fast forward today, um, I've been over at Waltham uh, District Court for three years, and um, but prior to that, I served as an associate probation officer for uh, the Cambridge Juvenile Court of the Middlesex Division. Coming here today, I really did not want to sound too cliche, as most of the things I'm going to say are things that Judge Ellis probably already know. Uh, however, I wanted to speak from the heart, and I think that that's the best way to convey my message and convey uh, and, and speak about Judge Ellis. So I plan to do just that. I want to start off by simply saying thank you. Thank you for being an amazing person. Thank you for being an amazing mentor. Thank you for always treating everyone you come across uh, with respect, with courtesy, compassion, and dignity. Thank you, thank you, but most importantly, thank you for being a judge of reason, a judge of fairness who always makes decisions with patience, tact, and integrity. Jadalis, that is really a true reflection of who you are as a person and an honorable justice. My opportunity of working with Judge Ellis will be something I forever will remember. Um, I can give you a million examples of how great she is as a person. Um, however, I will say some of the moments that are, that are memorable to me were your moments of guidance, especially as a new probation officer in the district court. Everybody knows how terrifying that can be sometimes. Um, <clears throat> I will say that some of the moments that stood out to me the most were the moments of guidance. The moments, those moments developed me to becoming a professional who look at the totality of situations before making decisions. I became a probation officer who upholds the court orders while treating my probationers with respect and still being able to be assertive and firm while upholding court obligations. Your humility has always been transparent as a leader. And us over at Waltham District Court is beyond happy to have had you serve as First Justice. Although I am sad to see you go, I am so happy that others will continue to experience what we have experienced. Thank you for always uh, representing the criminal justice system to its highest honor. I really mean that. Thank you. That was from your head. Thank, Thank you. you. Any counselors have any questions? Thank you. No. Thank you very much. Next witness is Maya Sarah Crane. How did I do? Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> so, um, good afternoon to the members of the Governor's Council. I'm honored to have been invited by Sarah to speak on her behalf in this forum. Thank you all for giving me a few minutes to share some thoughts about Sarah as you consider her for a position in the Superior Court. I feel so fortunate to count Sarah as one of my closest friends. Sarah and I met almost 25 years ago when she and my husband, Brian, were classmates at Boston College Law School. During that time, Brian and I also became friends with her husband, Don, who was also a BC law student, and we've remained very close ever since. Our children are all within three years of each other and have grown up feeling like cousins. Sarah and Don have welcomed us at many family gatherings, so we've been able to get to know her parents, Marilyn and John, and her sister and her family as well. Over many years, we've been friends. We've enjoyed vacations together, outings around the city, and spent countless evenings sharing dinner and great conversation. It's with 25 years of knowing Sarah that I can so enthusiastically support her pursuit of her role with the Superior Court. From a personal perspective, Sarah possesses all of the qualities most valued in a friend. I hold Sarah in the highest regard, and it's difficult to describe in just a few minutes what makes her so exceptional. Sarah is thoughtful, caring, and willing to have tough, honest conversations when they are most needed. She cares deeply about her family, her friends, and her profession. She's a natural leader, and her confidence, intelligence, and empathy elicit respect from all who spend time with her. While Sarah and I enjoy a friendship based on shared values and interests and have spent lots of time laughing and having fun, I've also had an opportunity to peek into her professional world. 
About two years ago, my husband was appointed to the bench as an Associate Justice at the Juvenile Court. Sarah was an invaluable resource to Brian in considering service on the bench and shared both the rewards and challenges that are inherent in the role. Sarah's comments always reflected the immense respect she felt for the courts, the public served by them, and the staff that supports their operation. She spoke about the law with a passion that drives her to meet a very high bar every day in her role in the district court. Since my husband's appointment to the juvenile court, I've had an opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of the qualities it takes to be a good judge. Sarah treats everyone with respect and understands the importance of due process and the right to be heard. She is experienced, smart, and decisive. She's compassionate and has the capacity to be fair and balanced. The fact that Sarah has become a leader among her peers is a testament to her legal knowledge, personality, and hard work. She is someone who brings out the best in those around her because she demands the same high standards of herself. I've often joked with my husband and others that know us that while I'm a little older than Sarah, um, I say one day when I grow up, I wanna be Sarah Ellis. Her poise, kindness, and intelligence are apparent to all who know her and her leadership by example elevates every team she is a part of. I have no doubt that she would bring all of these qualities to the Superior Court to the great benefit of each courtroom where she presides. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. So, um, have any questions? Questions? No, that was, thank you very much. I really value that. Is there anyone here that's not on the witness list who would like to say something about this nominee in favor? In chat. All right, hearing none, is there anyone in opposition? Hearing none, now it's your turn, uh, Judge, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the governor's counselors for your consideration of my confirmation and for holding this hearing today, and to Councillor Devaney uh, for hosting this hearing. I'd like to thank Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito and Governor Charlie Baker for the honor of this nomination to the Superior Court. I'd like to thank Bob Ross, legal counsel to Governor Baker, and Lauren Green Pedrigno, the deputy legal counsel to Governor Baker and the executive director of the JNC for their consideration and their support. To the members of the Judicial Nominating Commission, I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be a part of this process again. I would like to thank Chief Justice Paul Dolly of the District Court, retired Chief Justice Paula Carey of the Trial Court, retired Chief Justice Judith Fabricant of the Superior Court, and Chief Justice Heidi Brieger of the Superior Court, who I understand had a conflict with today's hearing, for the opportunities they've given me to work for them and with them on important work impacting our court system. I'd like to thank those uh, that I've previously introduced uh, who were here today uh, to be my witnesses. Uh, I know that it was difficult uh, to run the region and come here to testify for me today. And we do have many uh, court officials here. Uh, so I recognize if you need to leave at some point uh, to get back to court and uh, it's an open session so you can leave at any time. But thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to thank those in this room who have supported me, believed in me, and encouraged me throughout my career. I'd like to thank my parents, Marilyn and John Wayland. My parents encouraged my talents, solicited my, solicited my opinions, and taught me to believe in my own abilities. They supported decisions I made, whether that they believed with, they agreed with them or not, and they fostered in me the self-confidence to go to law school, to be a litigator, and to stand up and to speak out. My mother is a retired middle school guidance counselor and English teacher, and from her I learned to examine and question my own feelings, motives, and beliefs. She encouraged my sister and me to widen our perspectives to better understand where other people are coming from. My father is a retired computer systems analyst who attended graduate school in the evenings when I was a young girl to earn his doctorate. From him, we learned to tackle problems with patience, precision, and persistence. From both my parents, I learned the value of hard work, as well as to love learning for learning's sake, and that it is a privilege to be able to dedicate yourself to work that is also your passion. My sister, Laura Twilliger, who cannot be here today, uh, is a true optimist, and I deeply support her, life, her uh, lifetime of love and loyalty. I'd like to thank my in-law families on the West Coast who may be watching this feed, uh, to Steve and Helen Ellis and John and Bobby Bridge. From the beginning, you've accepted me as family and your love and your support has been very important to me. 
Thank you to my husband, Don, who I met in 1999 at Boston College Law School. And as we approach our 20th wedding anniversary in just two weeks, he has been my steadfast champion and ally. He has always encouraged me to follow my heart, to trust in myself, and he has supported me throughout. Finally, I'd like to thank my two daughters who are ages 16 and 13. When they sat over here uh, just five years ago, they were kids. And I could not be more proud of the individuals they are growing into. My younger daughter cannot be here today as she has her middle school theatrical debut uh, this afternoon, uh, but my older daughter uh, is here. And I appreciate that both my daughters are compassionate, loyal, smart, kind, funny, diligent, and brave. I am excited to watch them find their passions, pursue their goals, and to make the world a better place. My desire to be a public servant grew in part from the many values I learned from my grandparents and my parents. I didn't grow up in a family of lawyers, the freed Fogelson, Ronan, Whalen melting pot from which I am immediately descended, had many smart, creative, and driven people, but their talents didn't lead them to the study of law. I was raised with an emphasis on education, intellectual curiosity, hard work, and self-sufficiency with a strong emphasis on being true to myself in all circumstances. I wanted to become a lawyer because my experiences taught me that the law is a powerful tool to help others. In college, I worked as a receptionist, typist, and clerk in a small medical malpractice firm. There I met people who had suffered debilitating injuries and illnesses who had turned to the law for recourse. In the state's attorney's office in Maryland, where I volunteered through many of those same years, I assisted victims of violent crime and their family members who were waiting for trial, scared to testify, <clears throat> but finding the courage because they believed our legal system would deliver justice. Being a judge in the district court for the past five years has been a privilege and an honor. I have seen the impact that poverty, lack of education, substance use disorders, trauma, and mental health have on the lives and choices of people appearing before me every day. It has been immensely rewarding to use my education and experience to serve our communities, as well as parties in need of the court's intervention. The work of the district court is immediate and impactful. The colleagues I have had the honor to work alongside in the district court are serious about our work, dedicated to serving the people before the court and wonderfully supportive to each other. When I worked in the administrative office of the district court for Chief Justice Dolly, I valued the intellectual aspects of the position, including the opportunity to delve into many of the district court's more complex legal matters. I participated in multiple initiatives across trial court departments, analyzing how legal, procedural, and statutory changes could advance the administration of justice. Our work was focused both on continuing to improve the court system as a whole, as well as examining specific and often novel legal issues as they arose. And I found this work to be interesting and engaging. Until I joined the district court bench, I didn't realize how much I missed the direct connection of my work to the lives of specific people. Every day I make decisions that directly and immediately impact the lives of individuals before the court. My decisions resonate in the communities that I serve. I am very aware of the responsibility of my position on the bench and my role as a public servant. I embrace these aspects of being a trial court judge and I find the prospect of positively impacting the lives of those before me to be extremely motivating. My hope is that, should you vote to confirm me, sitting on the Superior Court bench will have an opportunity to build, will be an opportunity to build upon both my ardent intellectual curiosity and my strong desire to serve the public. Presiding over complex civil and criminal litigation would be exciting to me academically, but I also appreciate the high stakes and the deeply personal nature of such cases for those involved in the Superior Court. I would endeavor, as I do now, to treat all litigants with respect compassion, and dignity. Judges are called upon to keep an open mind. Over the past five years, I've had the opportunity to reflect on this directive. It's often used as a figure of speech more than an instruction. What does it mean truly to keep an open mind, to truly consider something that way? We all bring our unique life experiences, perceptions, and references to anything that we consider. 
The challenge to approach each case, each litigant, each circumstance with fresh eyes appears on its face to divorce us uh, from our history and experience. So in practice, what does that mean to keep an open mind? To me, keeping an open mind is about humility. As judges and those here who practice in our trial courts, we see a lot. People on their worst days, in crisis situations, and impacted by trauma. Writer and novelist Paul Oster wrote in his work, The New York Trilogy, every life is inexplicable. No matter how many facts are told, no matter how many details are given, the essential thing resists telling. For any person appearing before the court, we judges see the aspects of a litigant presented to us, but we cannot appreciate all the complexities that has led each person to the circumstances that they face. We may study legal, legal concepts comprehensively, but we are constantly challenged to apply these concepts to the unique lives of the people before us. A dear friend to many of us here lived by the phrase, there is nothing more ignorant than certainty. This is an important and central mantra to any judge. The promise we make as judges is that we will be fair and we will be impartial. To do so, we must be active listeners, we must patrol our consciousness for bias, and we must be humble enough to recognize limitations in our own knowledge and experience and keep the open mind necessary to process new ideas, arguments, and perspectives. Those before us, are deserving of decisions made with reason, compassion, and humility. I'm deeply thankful to this governor's council for the opportunity to serve as a district court judge. Five years ago, you entrusted me with this position, and I've worked to honor your confidence and your trust. If confirmed to the superior court, I am confident that I would continue my career on the bench in a manner that serves the public fairly and utilizes my professional and personal strengths. Thank you. I look forward to any questions you may have for me. Thank you very much. Um, I open up to the council and um, we go by the rules and I will call on Councilor Duff. Thank you. Um, you know, I, you know, I'm very impressed with you, not your resume, your education, liberal arts education, which you would be fan of. Share with your parents the ability to read and write, which I think is underestimated today. Um, and Kenyon College is just a tremendous place to have studied as an undergraduate. So, well, good on you. Um, I also like very much that um, you spoke about your children as being brave. I think that is, uh, I think being brave and having courage in this world. We all need to have a lot of them that they're hard to have. So I hope they can continue that with the guidance of, of you and your husband. Um, I really only have one question. We didn't talk about it. It's not in your resume. Um, do you like baseball? No. <laughs> I have two questions. So I was in drama club. As you know from our conversations, I am, um, to my detriment, uh, not a particular sports enthusiast, and my husband is grimacing as I say that, and you have uh, Justice Dickhoff behind you. <laughs> uh, but I have to admit uh, to my own deficient knowledge in the area of baseball. Okay. <laughs> um, I had an algebra teacher that would sometimes write VOD on a of the doubt. Um, so I'll give you benefit of the doubt on that. Eight. Baseball. So that is also a loading question. It is a loading question. Family. You didn't think that. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I know that uh, the hometown uh, carries a day in this conversation. I will say that my family's from <clears throat> New Jersey and uh, my husband uh, grew up with a grandfather uh, in Seattle, but who grew up in New Jersey. Uh, so I have to admit, especially if my uncle's watching. These guys are looking at you like, come on. I know, so now's when everyone's in the room leaves. I enjoy watching the Red Sox play baseball. John, I have no further questions. Councilor Kennedy, 
I started interviewing you for this job the day you started in the DA's office. Well, I don't have to ask you any questions. I've been uh, asking you questions for a decade and a half at least. So I'll, I'll vote for you. Okay, Councilor Powell. Thank you. Well, the weighty issues are out of the way, so I have some inconsequential things. Um, you know, anytime I get multiple phone calls from Councilor Kennedy about a nominee, it raises a lot of red flags. So hopefully this goes okay. So I, whenever I ask this, I preface it sometimes <clears throat> with the disclaimer that I have no problem with prosecutors. I entered law school intending to be a prosecutor. Uh, my first summer internship was in the pro was in the Suffolk County DA's office. The child abuse division changed the trajectory of my life and justice dickhop no way he remembers but he I, he gave me the opportunity to write two appellate briefs um that summer so um it was a great summer uh and if the DA, ada's were paid more i would have uh, gladly pursued that path um nonetheless i do concern myself with ballots on the bench and so we do continue to have a, a preponderance of our judges coming from prosecutorial backgrounds I know obviously you've been on the bench um, for some time now since that experience, um, but how can you assuage my concern about having a broader perspective than just the pro uh, prosecutorial mindset? Well, I would rely on my, my track record on the district court bench. Um, I have um, endeavored to be fair and balanced. I think that my experience as a prosecutor was important uh, in terms of my education uh, and my frame of reference. And I think one of the things that you learn in that position, especially as it relates to district court, but really superior court as well, is that both defendants and victims come to the equation with a lot of obstacles. And um, people who, were defend who are defendants before the court may have in the past been victims of other things in their own right. And life is difficult for people. I spoke in my uh, remarks about poverty, mental health, lack of education, uh, substance use disorder, and that's something that we see every day, and it limits the choices of the people before us. Uh, so I think that both my experience as a prosecutor and then reinforced by the fast, past five years that I've learned that compassionate and understanding is central to what we do. So when's the last time uh, that you had a chance to visit a House of Corrections uh, facility? So I went when I joined the district court bench, um, I believe, and before that, I probably visited the Bill Ricca House of Correction at least three times as a prosecutor. Um, we preside over cases um, in our early uh, judgeship in different, um, all over the all over the state. Uh, so I've been to, for instance, the Worcester um, prison, which is also a mental hospital. Um, so I, I've been to various, I would say, facilities that also act as houses of correction. And do you think it's important for judges to periodically visit these places? Absolutely. Yes. Because if we're sentencing people to the House of Correction, we ought to know what it means um, and what a hardship it is. Um, something uh, you said about, you know, understanding victims, defendants coming before you are often have been victims of something ahead of time. Uh, in your application, uh, talking about discretion, one factor you raised was victim impact statements. And I'm wondering, uh, how does a victim impact statement, or does, in your opinion, a victim impact statement um, help a judge to apply the law to a set of circumstances? Does it have any impact on how the law applies to the underlying incident? Potentially, uh, it does in the context of sentencing. Um, so, as you know, under the Victim Bill of Rights, judges are required to consider victim impact statements, uh, either written or oral, before the judge decides on a sentence, even if it's an agreed tender of plea. Uh, so, it's important to me that if a victim of a crime wishes to make an impact statement, that they have the forum to be heard, uh, that I'm not predetermining the sentence before I hear from them. Uh, how that crime impacted them and affected their life might inform what conditions of probation that I think are appropriate. For instance, if it's a relationship where the victim felt that 
alcohol use was a component or the intimate partner abuse education program. Mm -hmm. um, and it also, frankly, may inform the severity of the punishment if this was a crime that was particularly egregious and had a lasting emotional impact on the victim. If the victim's not there or if the victim, for whatever reason, hasn't been as impacted as another victim for a similar crime, does that lead to a stiffer sentence because of, because of that? That's a good question. I think it's hard to answer in the abstract just because I try to judge every case with the specifics about that case that are before me. Um, and victims are informed of their right to make an impact statement by the district attorney's office. And often that office represents to the court what the wishes of the victim are or whether they don't perhaps wish to be heard. Um, but I, I try very hard to consider a variety of factors before I decide upon a sentence. Okay. Um, and uh, you, I believe, currently serve, although I know that your application was written, I don't know how many months ago, on the trial court committee to end racism and systemic barriers to justice. Yes. That's quite a title for a committee. Um, what, and in the time of your application, you wrote about intending, you know, it sounded like it was in its infancy. What's going on there? So that is a trial court committee, uh, and I'm turning to Judge Fortz because Judge Fortz uh, leads the district court uh, committee on racial and ethnic fairness. And this committee in particular is a trial court committee of which there are different working group subcommittees. The subcommittee uh, of which I am a member is led by Judge Paul Smith. And yes, at the time that I applied, the committee was uh, just at its, its early stages. And to a certain extent, we still are. Um, the committee, the jury subcommittee, is looking specifically at what, what obstacles exist uh, that would impede the right to a fair jury trial. Mm -hmm. And we intend to examine topics such as the use of peremptory strikes, mm -hmm. whether hardship excusals uh, are related um, across the board to low income um, low income jurors, uh, jurors who need child care. We're also looking at the felony exclusion, which right now I believe is a seven year felony exclusion and ought that number be shrunk. But in order to examine these questions, we're very much in the data collection mode right now. And as you know from the Harvard study, uh, which went into depth on the different methods to collect data, uh, relying on one database alone is insufficient. We certainly have access to mass courts, um, in the Harvard study, they cross-referenced the mass courts data with DeSegis, and that's important to drill down on individual cases and numbers of defendants. Do you believe that uh, there should be more uh, data collection and sharing among some of the organizations in our justice system? Do you believe that we're missing important data, especially in the Harvard study? So I think one of the obstacles, I've thought about this a lot on the basis of the different committees that I've been a part of, I think a, one of the main obstacles is that a system like mass courts was purchased and used as a case management system with a very discrete purpose within the trial court. And we're now asking it to generate information that it wasn't necessarily designed to collect and might be collecting inconsistently based on individual practices in courts. And I think it's important for the court system to look at that across the board to see where we want to go in the future and what's the information we need to pull out of it and then educate the, the um, employees of the court system about how to input that data. But to your question about sharing data, I think that we saw the power of sharing data in that study, which was so specific um, and came out with, I think, important results for everyone to know of. You very well know then that the sentencing disparities along racial lines happen in Superior Court, where Black and Latino defendants are twice as likely to be um, brought to when there's concurrent jurisdiction with the district court, which obviously exposes them to longer potential sentences, but also, in fact, does result in longer sentences um, for similarly situated defendants. Uh, entering superior court, do you have a role to play in addressing that? Yes, I think every superior court. How does a superior court judge or any judge, how, 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 would, how would you approach that process? 
So as you know, minimum mandatory uh, penalties uh, do play a part, and that's a charging decision. But as you point out, what the Harvard study showed us is that there is a role uh, for the judiciary as well, and that even in minimum mandatory sentences, what the data reflects accounting for different variables is that people of color are sentenced to longer sentences. So I think the, the first component of this is awareness and education. And I think it's important to recognize when you're looking, for instance, at a criminal history, uh, that if someone is uh, living in uh, a certain city or town uh, at a certain poverty level in certain communities that have lower income levels, that they may have more points of contact with law enforcement. And that may result in more entries on their board of probation record. And that people don't start with an even playing field on these issues. And I think it's important to bring that education to review of the different factors that you're considering when sentencing someone. I appreciate your time this morning. I have no further questions for you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Hurley. Yes, thank you. Uh, we spoke at some length. Um, I reviewed your application, which is amazing. The fact that you are the co-chair of the Education Committee for the District Court um, speaks well, not only of you, but of Mark, um, who was there for a long time. I served on that committee. I know how in depth the work is um, you get exposed not just to criminal you get exposed to civil all different kinds of issues that are more not only our court in the district court but throughout the court system mm -hmm. so i really don't have any questions um we've got phone calls from judge smith a number of other judges that i've known and also from Tina Cafaro, who were part of the Education Committee um, mentor team that that has her putting have her, has her being put through her paces, and the word she used was awesome. Uh, and it's not the only time I heard awesome, unbelievable, um, incredible work ethic, etc. Uh, I really don't have any questions that have not already been touched upon. My big thing is protecting victims uh, while giving defendants a fair trial, and that includes the issue of bail. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, I regret the loss of you in the district court, but I applaud your willingness to work. I think I described it as the district court deals with short stories and the superior court deals with novels. So your willingness to get involved in oftentimes multi-issue matters that can take a lot of time and a lot of thought and a lot of effort. Mm. I am confident that you will be a rising star in the Superior Court in short order. So I am gonna vote for you. Mm. Thank you very much for your time and good luck to you. Thank you, Councilor Gurley. Thank you. Councilor Ferrara. You and I have spoke uh, several times and uh, you have a plethora of uh, unbelievable letters from high-ranking people. Uh, your reputation is uh, stellar. I'm not one to ask questions for the sake of asking questions. Uh, I applaud uh, you wanting to go to the Superior Court. I was a Superior Court law clerk 30 years ago, and I appreciate the work that um, the great Superior Court judges do, take home work and work at night and weekends. So I applaud you for one. And I thank you for your service, and you're gonna be a great Superior Court judge. You have my vote next week. Thank you, Councilor Farrow. Thank you, Joseph Bell. Uh, to follow up on Councilor Apollo's um, point about the study from Harvard, uh, it's been about, I'm guessing, three years since the study came out, or is it four? I, yeah, I feel like it's closer to four. I'm sorry, I don't have the date of the study. So we all know about it now. At least everybody that's really study. Do you feel that anything has changed based on that in our court system? I hope so, but I can't answer that specifically uh, because I don't know what the sentencing uh, and detention statistics reflect. 
but I know that the courts court leadership has uh, made it a mission to educate judges that study. Uh, it is required reading, and um, I think a lot of the aspects of that study are important for judges to consider when looking at all of the variables that lead you to uh, a bail decision all the way to sentencing. I haven't obviously done any studies after that study, but I am in the Superior Court a lot and the District Court a lot. And I don't get a sense it has changed. I hope I'm wrong. I hope it has, but I don't. I don't get that sense. I think the charging by DAs hasn't changed much. The discrepancy pointed out in the study is that black and Latinos get charged or indicted more than than a white proportion of the population. Uh, I still feel that hasn't changed much. And of course, everybody plays a hand in what the study said it was one word for what's going on in our system was racism. You know, word. So I know everybody plays a hand in it. I mean, the, the charging authorities charge and it, it winds up in the lap of a, a judge. Um, for worse, you're stuck with it, right? To some extent. Sorry, stuck with what? With the charges that are before you and the defendant comes up. Uh, and again, I haven't done a study on the amount of incarceration since that, but I, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't get a sense it has changed much. And the only way people end up in prisons or houses of correction is because the judge puts them there. Um, I, I get the sense that the minority members of our state that live in minority areas of our state interact on a higher level with police and individuals that don't live in those areas. As a result, the more contact police, the more chance that they're going to get charged with a crime. I don't, I don't see that change much since the study. But I, again, I couldn't be wrong. So, from the study, what do you glean you can do in the superior courts? I guess bring your knowledge on the issue, help in any way you can to alter the course we've been on up to the study and maybe right up to now? I think it's important to bring an educated eye to the information that's put before the judge about any individual before the court. Uh, one of the things that the study talked about is uh, people of color, people of color, men in particular, being charged uh, with, with gun and drug offenses at a higher rate than people who are white. And to, to your point, the judge does not control what the charge is, uh, but we certainly can look at someone's criminal history to look at where they live, to see what those early interactions were with law enforcement, and to decide how much weight to give that information on the basis of the challenges that that particular individual faces. I get the sense that the system is baked into our system since 1780 when we started having courts in the county. And I think it ended up pretty pervasive through our system in ways that we don't even recognize it. I bring up the point that I, for all these years in the court system, we look, at we look at a person's record. If that looks bad, okay. the DA looks at it. Make our arguments based on that. But it seems to me, and this is just my own opinion, that there is some 
racism in that issue. Because the people that are, live in the minority areas, since they have more of a chance to interact with police, or a chance to end up with records, get sentenced more later on in their career when they come into a court. The same individual from a affluent white community probably interacts with police but doesn't get charged as much. So I believe in, I've been told all my life that somebody commits a crime and they're punished, they do their punishment to the Commonwealth, that, that's it. They've done, their, they've done their penalty and that's the end of it. It's not the end of it in our court system. It's used again and again and again. You give higher sentences, mostly in proportion to minorities. But that's, that's just the thing I've thought of in the last couple of years, and that issue of just the, the sentence. I may be wrong in it. Maybe it, there's nothing to do with racism. I don't know. But it, it seems to me that may be one of the reasons why that disparity in our correction system is there. When you're on the Superior Court, you can, you can look in with um, I thought you had a wonderful uh, resume uh, when you came before us for the District Court. And I thought then you were going to make a wonderful judge, and I haven't heard anything that would dissuade me from that today. And I've received a lot of calls and, and letters that came in for you. Madam Shera called me over the weekend. I spoke very highly of you, obviously. And uh, I think you've done a heck of a job on the district court, and I think you'll be a good asset to the Superior Court. So I, I will vote for you. I don't know how many times I'm going to have to keep voting for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, it, was, it was just such a pleasure when I saw your name going to the Superior Court. Thank you for applying. Um, first of all, I've got to recognize your mother. And she's sitting in the governor's chair. <laughs> but um, you might not know it, but Judge Ellison, I'll share this. My name is Marilyn. And my late husband was John. Mm -hmm. Jelly, your mom and dad. So, having said that, um, I, I, first I'd like to ask you: um, When did you think of going up to the Superior Court? What What was it that gave you that, um, you know, that innovation to say, "I think I, I could do better. I could do more." I wouldn't say better because I don't mean that word. That's not a good word. Uh, but I love the word complex, small complex. Yes, I am. Um, so for me, uh, it was a decision that I started thinking about um, approximately a year ago, maybe perhaps a little bit longer. Uh, the work in the district court that I've gravitated to, that I've, I've found most fulfilling over time, has been the more complex legal issues. Um, I uh, was talking earlier today about the unicorn that is the four-day uh, district court trial. And I've, ha I've been fortunate to have some complex interesting um, and impactful jury trials in the district court and the thought that I could do more of that um, and that I could tackle more complex issues is really interesting to me and I think it would be very fulfilling. Well, I, I couldn't be happier being here 23 years to have someone like you with your experience as a judge going to a higher court. I mean, I've seen in the past years someone with six cases that went to Superior Court. That's not, that's not right, and, and it's not fitting for, to represent the people of Massachusetts. So I thank you. You have brought, um, you know, you have been involved in programs that I haven't seen with other, other, you know, other people that come before me for a judgeship. 
And um, I really would like you to talk about that. Um, one of them was um, your judicial trip for equal justice. I have talked on and on about, um, I'm very concerned about racial um, equality and, and the racial bias in the Massachusetts schools. And we talked about that when we met. Thank you for meeting me again at the diner. And um, you know, um, you are on the Hall of Fame for the um, Belgian Waffle as uh, Judge Dickoff and, and Judge, so I thank you for that. But tell me about that. Tell me what you, what you gained from that and, and how you proceeded with that, what you learned. So uh, as you may know, uh, our late Chief Justice of the SJC, Ralph Gantz, uh, organized a trip for judges uh, to go down to Montgomery, Alabama uh, to visit the Equal Justice Initiative, which is a museum uh, and monument uh, that was created by Brian Stevenson and uh, his team of colleagues. And what the museum examines, uh, and I was able to take my husband with me, uh, who went on that trip as well, what the museum examines is uh, the history of the African American experience in this country, uh, beginning with the slave trade, uh, the experience of enslaved people, uh, through to the Civil War. My daughter studied AP US history uh, this year, and we had a lot of discussions about the information from that museum and how it did or did not track the information that was taught in their curriculum through to the Civil Rights Movement. And the museum really makes the case that the mass incarceration of young men of color uh, in this country is a direct offshoot of, the, of Jim Crow's legacy. Um, and it makes a compelling uh, and impactful argument for that position. The other, aside from the museum, there's also a memorial to peace and justice. And that memorial is a memorial to everyone in this country who was lynched. And it's staggering. It's um, the, the, the way that the museum is set up when you walk in uh, is that there are monoliths that hang from the ceiling that memorialize every death due to lynching by county. And as you travel down the spiral of the museum, these monoliths are turned on their side so that they go from looking like tombstones to looking like gravestones, um, graves. And it's, it's staggering. Um, and I'm so thankful that I had that experience uh, I hope that we can take our children to that museum in the future because I think it's important uh, for children to grow up with that information. And after the trip to the museum and the memorial, the judges met uh, with Chief Justice Gantz and, and shared our reflections, our hopes for the court system and ways that we saw we might be able to effectuate change. All right. Um, also, um, which is, something I'm concerned about, uh, domestic violence, and you were on that uh, domestic violence and sexual assault uh, council. So um, what, uh, what did you bring from that to, you know, to help you in, in your position as a judge? In the district court and in the superior court, we see uh, a lot of um, domestic violence and sexual assault crimes are some of the most serious cases that come before us as judges. Uh, we were looking, uh, when I first joined the committee, at education initiatives for judges and for all court staff. Uh, before I joined the bench, uh, when I was part of the administrative office of the district court, I worked with Judge Marianne Hinkle uh, to come up with a training curriculum, which is required by statute beginning in 2014, for all court personnel to receive training on domestic violence, uh, to understand what reoffense and fatality risk factors are, uh, to understand the directive to send for certain crimes to intimate partner abuse education program, and also to understand that defendants uh, who are charged with crimes of domestic violence were often as children uh, the victims of domestic violence themselves, that it is truly a vicious cycle in that regard. I, I want people here to know that um, um, I ask questions. I don't ask questions for the sake of asking questions. I know this judge. I have met her for hours um, when she first came before me and last week when we met again. But I want people out there, thank God for public access now, to hear 
why this person is qualified, why she's experienced in her personal life. And that's why I ask questions. So um, the council doesn't like me asking questions. So they established a 15 minute rule that I'm ignoring today, okay? And it's supposed to be only 15 minutes between the counselor and the nominee, but you deserve to talk about your achievements and what you've been involved in. I was very interested in um, your involvement with Justice Agnes, wonderful, wonderful man, and Judge Tickock. You are involved in um, some publications and you're still working on one with the judge here. But uh, tell us about that. I know, but you tell us. <laughs> uh, so Justice Dickhoff is smiling. Uh, so as you know, Justice Dickhoff and I uh, had the um, honor of working together for Chief Justice Dolly at the administrative office of the district court. We started on the same day. Uh, we had cubicles right next to each other. And um, working with someone as smart as Justice Dickhoff, you learn a lot. Uh, but in to your question about uh, Judge Agnes. So Judge Agnes, uh, uh, as you know, uh, is the president of the Flashner uh, Institute at this time, and he has developed several publication initiatives for Flashner. And uh, Justice Dickhoff and myself and others across court departments are working to write a book on probation violation proceedings. Yeah. So that um, has been an, an opportunity for us to continue our academic uh, interaction and our friendship. And I've also been working with Justice Hanlon on uh, publishing a book on harassment works. Well. No, that, that's great. No, that's something that we don't hear of. And I want to give you the opportunity to talk on that. Um, the other thing is your publications. That, that, that's to me, um, very important that you've taken the time to write things and um it, it tell us about the publication you wrote about um what was it the um i'm trying to think the jury proceedings or what was that one particularly i'm trying to think i'm not sure the one of the publications yeah. that i i had a occasion well, to write about was it probation or i don't remember um oh i know uh drug courts and how they impact participants, courts, and communities. And I have gone to drug courts, and I, I've said this before, I went to the graduation and I cried. Those people who were drug addicted for years and alcohol, alcoholics, and what this program did for them. And it, it was just, I sat in the back and tears came to my eyes when they talked about how it, how, how it changed their lives. Um, and, and I wanted to know, these specialty courts, are they productive? They are, they are, they really are. So tell me about that, right? Uh, I had the opportunity um, to work with Judge Hogan Sullivan, uh, who at the time was fulfilling a specific role for the trial court uh, in terms of attempting to accredit our different drug courts. And uh, in doing so, I worked with her on writing the drug court guide. Uh, I think Justice Dickhoff had a piece in that as well. Uh, the drug court guide to uh, lay out a map for drug courts to be reviewed by experts and accredited. And after that, I had the opportunity to write that um, article about the actual impact that drug court has had on the lives of specific individuals. Um, I'm looking at Judge Fords because Lowell has a very robust drug court, and I think for all of the judges who've presided over that, uh, and we try to use the same you know, judge who gets to know the litigants, who gets to understand their personal histories, and therefore can hopefully craft sanctions that are immediate and specific to them. Um, we find drug court to be uh, difficult, reward right um i had to bring this up it's um about um public someone in public office um that you took on that case and taking money from the packing meters and everything and i'm just going to give a little history to the people here the judge was judge sakura i'll tell you about judge sakura he had a case in the district court on Halloween, and he instructed jurors to come in Halloween costumes. Can you imagine, as a priest, as a nun, as a traffic post, as, as a clown? That's Judge Akura. 
So you, you, he was the judge and you brought that before him and you could tell us about what that woman did and, and uh, she was responsible for the money. And you tell us. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it. I was not in Halloween costume. That did not come up in the context of that trial. Uh, but that was an embezzlement case that I tried in the Superior Court as a prosecutor. And uh, the embezzlement scheme involved a woman who worked for the city of Lowell uh, parking clerk's office. And she was accepting uh, payments for parking tickets. And she was logging the payments as having been made with the Registry of Motor Vehicles because there was a direct connection between uh, how the clerk connected the mo uh, collected the money, their computer system, and then how that was forgiven through the registry so that it wouldn't result in a license suspension. Well, she became sick. Uh, and she wasn't in the office for several weeks in order to make those corrections within the computer system so that people's licenses were starting to show up as suspended when they knew that they had paid the parking clerk the money. And so the complaints started coming in to uh, the city of Lowell about that. And there was an investigation that was launched and there was an audit that was performed and it was extensive. And that, that was a heavy paper case uh, on the one hand that involved bank records. It was about body. What thousand? Am I, yeah. yeah, it was it was over forty thousand uh, dollars when it was all said and done. But it took a long time to uncover the amount of the larceny and the number of people that were impacted, as well as understanding all the repercussions of that in terms of their registry of motor vehicle status and all the other fees that they had to pay because of that. Eventually, uh, everything <laughs> ahead when. Uh, other members of the office discovered envelopes of cash taped under her desk uh, in the parking office, uh, and then they were really honing their investigation on her. Um, and one thing that was interesting about that case, when you have that amount of money, is you wonder what happened to the money, and that was never discovered definitively, although it was believed by her colleagues that she had a gambling addiction, as well as her husband who testified at the trial for the defense. Um, but it was it was a fascinating case. It took a lot of uh, financial investigation to build the case, and she was convicted. I can't go over everything, all your cases, because they're just fantastic. But one of them um, was um, a case, and, and we talked about it, uh, where there was a driver that, that killed a police officer, a state police officer, that was on um, a detail. And you want to tell us about what happened? So I'm not sure what Well, what happened, happened was she um, was driving and ran over the police officer and killed him. And so I thought that you judged properly and, and you gave her a sentence. It wasn't enough. Like sent, but was proper for what happened. You don't remember that? I, I don't remember that specific case being in front of me as a judge. I certainly uh, have had the opportunity to uh, examine in the context of the administrative office of the district uh, different police officer fatalities and uh, judicial decisions that were made regarding license status uh, leading up to that in terms of an after action analysis. But I don't believe that I've had a case as a district court judge. regarding. Anyway, it was a short term, but I thought it was appropriate and I'm going back to my history and my knowledge of judges. And there was a case where um, a woman in her 50s was speeding and ran over and killed a local police officer who was on a special detail at a construction site. And um, the officer had a wife, five children, 13 to two. And when it went to court, the judge ruled, I told you, the judge ruled suspension of her license for six months. And then he turned to the widow holding the two-year-old with her other children and said, do you know what it is to go without a license? You can't drive for six months. I don't want that kind of a judge. And I just said his name before, I'm not gonna say it again. And that's what I see. So um, I do my homework and I really, you know, I have been so proud of my vote for you. I vote for Judge Boyce, my judge, Judge Ditkoff, 
Uh, I'm very proud of it. And when I do occasionally vote no, I tell why. I document it, and it's documented in my in our office. So um, you know, but so when you look at your district court experience, is there one case that you look at, maybe with pride, maybe with sadness, but it's something you'll always remember? Well, one case that comes to mind is the case that was the basis for my writing sample, uh, where I was uh, reversed by the Supreme Judicial Court on an issue pertaining to harassment orders. Uh, it was a case out of the Lawrence District Court involving high school students and uh, a song that one of the students published about another student uh, who had been in his chemistry class the year before, uh, and the lyrics involved a series of threats uh, to commit physical harm against the student, his girlfriend, uh, and the student's family members, uh, involving threats to shoot and to rape and other disturbing uh, threats. I extended the harassment order, and the issue, the legal issue, was what constituted three separate acts. Um, I made written findings, uh, and the case was appealed uh, to the appeals court and then to the Supreme Judicial Court. My analysis, I recognized at the time, uh, pertained to novel legal issues, ones that had not been decided specifically in the past. Uh, and I made the best judgment that I could at the time. I felt because there were separate crimes that were threatened uh, against these individuals that uh, although there was one song, there were separate lyrics that constituted the threats, and because the song itself was published on different social media platforms directed at different audiences within the high school and beyond, that those acts constituted separate acts under the 25080 harassment statute. I was wrong. The Supreme Judicial Court found that because it was one song containing these lyrics, uh, that those were not separate acts. And because the song was created on SoundCloud, which is one of the social media platforms distributed on SoundCloud and then distributed by way of Snapchat, uh, that that was one continuous act, I think perhaps given because the, um, the time parameters. Uh, and so I was reversed, but I think it was an important decision because we deal with those issues all the time. And it's always helpful to have the guidance. Well, you know what comes to mind, and maybe it's, it's not in the under harassment, but when we think of uh, that young man who got over a thousand emails from a young woman to commit suicide. So I know you had the hearing before me uh, with the judge who, as a prosecutor, uh, had handled yeah, that. That's the thing, you know, I, I, those, I'm sure those cases don't come up very often before you, and, and they are hard. Of course, I'm very opinionated, and I just feel he came out of the car, and perhaps he would have, he, he changed his mind. But she insisted he go back in. So I don't know. I mean, I, I just can't thank you enough for going to the Superior Court because you're going to get those kind of complex cases that judges 20, 30 years ago never had, you know. So um, I, I want to tell you, I got a lot of calls, but um, I had a long call with Judge Frank. And unbelievable. It was, it was so nice to catch up with him, and he couldn't say nice things about you. And Judge Machero, he said, she's the smartest person I know. Now, you don't hear that adjective, smart, by people coming in talking about, you know, you hear it in, in general, but he really emphasized that. So I do want to, you know, tell you that. But we got a lot of letters, and, um, and I... I do want to recognize them. One of them was uh, from Maryland. We work for um, uh, in, what did you work for? Uh, Root, what's his name? Judge Root? Yes, and he said that, you know, that you were so talented and um, everything you did was excellent and your judgment was outstanding and he's followed your um, career in Massachusetts and um, he is just so supportive of you and he said you will make a perfect superior court judge. So he has served the community with distinction. No better appointment could be made. Nice. And then 
Judge Judith Fabricant. And um, it, this is how many there are, so I can't write, I can't read all of it, but I, I do want to say that, you know, she talked about, in particular, during COVID, how, how you carried on. And I just want to intersect something. We talked about this, and I told you, I was very concerned about the 209As, because you even did it on the phone. And I'm saying, how do you know? You, you don't, you're not in person, you don't have eye contact, you don't see body language, and you're going to determine if this person is being truthful. Uh, you know, that to me, what people don't know what you people have gone through during COVID, decisions you've had to make, and maybe looking back, it, it might have been the wrong one, but you had no, nothing else to go on. It was all, you know, on the phone or whatever. So you got through that. Well, I, I have to take this opportunity to thank uh, the Waltham District Court because we uh, learned a lot about technology during the pandemic. And uh, we quickly realized that the phone conversations were not uh, a way to hold court. And the trial court got Zoom licenses, video conferencing license for us. And it was a team effort. Uh, and I'm looking at Assistant Chief Mitchell, who often not only is our court officer, but is our tech support in the first session uh, to train everyone in the courtroom and the clerk's office and the judge on how to start Zoom meetings, on how to bring people into Zoom meetings, um, and to run sessions both on a computer screen and also in person, often simultaneously. Uh, we've worked hard to get cameras into the courtroom that allow parties to see each other, even if one is in person and one is on Zoom. And because of the pandemic, it's permitted people who have COVID or been exposed to COVID, even at this point, to continue to participate in their in their court hearings. Well, I have to tell you how important it is for me to know your relationship with the people in the court, that you care about people, you care about all of them, and that's why they're here. That means a lot to me. And I, I always say I won't vote for anyone without compassion. And you've got to stamped on your forehead <laughs> so i'm very pleased in that so um so judge fabricant said a lot of good things about you and she said that um you know uh, that she recently persuaded you to apply for this appointment in the superior court isn't that something so she said that the governor has chose you and she's fully qualified by intellect, skill and in legal analysis and communication, dedication and temperament. She works hard, she is kind, sympathetic and humble in manner. She listens carefully and openly and she makes decisions. She has strong leadership skills, which I particularly value as a former chief justice I considered it my duty to seek out and cultivate potential leaders through appointment of judges to positions of regional administrative judge, justice, committee chair, mentor for new judges, and the like. Judge Ellis has demonstrated she has it all. If you vote to confirm her nomination, I expect to see her in positions of leadership before long. I recommend Judge Ellis for appointment to the Superior Count Court without reservation. Thank you for your consideration, and please feel free to contact me. We got a letter from um, Trial Court of Massachusetts, Chief Justice Paul Dolly, and he he's writing in support, and he said it was a privilege to work with you as Deputy General Counsel in the Administrative Office of the District Court for two years, and more recently as the Associate Justice of the District Court for the past five years. She, he has the highest recommendation for your, for your confirmation, and he said it will be a significant loss to the District Court. I'm certain that she will be an outstanding Superior Court judge, I can attest she's highly respected by her colleagues in the district court and members of the bar. Since her appointment in the district court in 2017, she has demonstrated superior trial and legal skills, strong worth ethic, 
highest level of integrity and an exceptional commitment to the court. She has earned a strong reputation in the respect of her judicial colleagues for her hard work and sense of fairness. Judge Ellis contributes to the tri trial courts are significant. She currently serves as first justice of the Waltham District Court, co-chair of the District Court Education Committee, chair of the jury, Management Advisory Committee appointed by the Supreme Judicial Court, a member of the court, a member of court member, a member of the Supreme Judicial Court Advisory Committee in Evidence Law, a member of the Trial Court Committee to end racist, racism and other system barriers, and a member of the Jury Trial Working Group. She has handled these responsibilities in a highly competent and professional manner. On a personal level, she is a wonderful friend and colleague. She is honest, caring, and dedicated to her family, friends, and colleagues. In summary, I believe she possesses the professional and personal attributes to be an excellent Superior Court judge. I enthusiastically support Judge Ellis, nomination as an Associate Justice of the Superior Court. If you have any questions, contact me. This is a, a letter from, okay, from um, Judge Beverly Cano. And she said she's known you for many years. Without reservations, she can't think of a better candidate. She met you when you joined Judge Justice Dolly's legal team and your stellar reputation as a prosecutor was something she has long known. She was a public defender for 24 years before becoming a judge and she recognizes in Sarah not only her exceptional trial skills but the fact that she is a person of the utmost integrity and was a prosecutor from who you could expect fair dealings. As a deputy general counsel, director of legal policy for Judge Dolly, Count Judge Ellis helped establish the professional excellence for which her office is known. She is instrumental in educating judges on topics as diverse as domestic violence, Uniform rules of impoundment, civil commitment and substance use disorder, and sentencing best practices. When she was appointed as the district court, she continued her teaching and committee work. In fact, Chief Justice Budd was so impressed with her that when Chief Justice Fabrica retired as the chair of the jury management advisory committee, Justice Budd appointed Judge Ellis's chair. This was extraordinary, as traditionally the position had been held by a Superior Court judge. When Judge Ellis was a newly appointed district judge, she appeared in Lawrence District Court, where my son Frankie was an ADA. At the end of her day there, Frankie called me to tell me that a new judge sat that day and that she was excellent. He com commented on how smart she was, how she knew the law, how she treated everyone with kindness and respect. I have since heard such comments about Judge Ellis from so many people. You know, it, 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 you know these are very long, so I, I'm going to stop there, but I just want to put that out, what people think of you and know you and, and believe what a wonderful superior judge you'll be. And so she ends up by saying the same qualities that have made Judge Ellis an outstanding district judge will make her an outstanding superior court judge. She's practical, balanced, fair. She is a critical thinker and she is competent in her abilities. Judge Ellis treats all who appear before her with dignity and respect I urge you to look favorable on her application. The next one is Judge Joseph Dipcock.
and he wants to express his, his enthusiasm for your nomination, and he got to know you in March 2014 when you both started at administrative office of the district court on the same day. He was general counsel, you were deputy. To say that we served side by side for the next two and one half years would be an understatement. There was not a single project which I did not rely on her expert assistance generously provided. She was instrumental in our efforts to address the opioid crisis, to reform the treatment of substance and disorders, to implement new laws to address domestic violence, and to address reforms in firearm regulation. And he talks about how about your humility and unflinching integrity, devotion to justice, and your kindness. And he enthusiastically supports you to be uh, in the Superior Court. And he, um, he said that he personally has knowledge of your judicial performance. And because of a recurring medical appointment in the Waltham District Court, I have repeatedly dropped in and witnessed Judge Ellis in action. I have watched her work through tricky, ethical issues with an attorney whose demeanor demonstrated that he knew he could trust Judge Ellis to treat him fairly and with respect. I have watched her connect with litigants and help them to understand what was expected of them and to navigate the litigation process. I have observed her treat the clerks, court offices, and other court staff like valued teammates and friends. And that's what I said that it's important to me. So she, in, in essence, he said, um, that he said that he was working together on a bench book for judges with you. And we're gonna hear from you about that. <laughs> when you've completed it. And he said, I cannot think of anyone who would make a finer Superior Court judge than Judge Ellis, and I commend her nomination for your favorable consideration. And we got a letter from um, Ryan Dugan, Waltham Complex, and um, he said that he's honored to write the letter and he is currently the chief court officer for the Waltham Complex since March of 2020. And um, he talks about um, that, that you have um, been steady in a calming voice inside the court and during these unprecedented times in the court system dealing with COVID and the many aspects it's presented you have always asked for the security department directives when it came to court business. You've had several meetings with all the departments with him and always included and respected any discussions that you've had. And he witnessed firsthand your command and control of a busy session in a way that is calming and respectful to all parties. There have been many cases that a defendant has been affected by substance abuse and has been before a first justice, Ellis. And in every way, you have taken command for that person for the hard work it takes to deal with to deal with the substance abuse. She takes the time to acknowledge families, friends that are in court to support the defendants and express how much it means to the court that they are here to support their family member. He talks about your leadership, and he said, the staff in Waltham is a very close-knit team, and that atmosphere comes right from First Justice Ellis. It is with great pride that I able, I'm able to write this letter and hopefully express the level of professionalism and caring that we have for Judge Ellis here in Waltham. And then he asked if anyone wants to this. And we have one from uh, First Justice Megan Spring. And, and she talks about um, serving with you and a you have a reputation of being intelligent, hardworking, and kind. And you work together and she um, 
said you were a champion of hers. And um, she said she read my application and prepared me for my interview to the district court bench. Sarah has consistently been an excellent mentor and she has treated almost every new judge who has come through the district court in the past years with respect. And she is respected and beloved by her colleagues. If she is confirmed by this body, it will be enormous loss to the district court. They all say that, <laughs> but an immense gain to the superior court. Serving as a superior court judge requires a slightly different skill set than the district court. And Sarah is more than capable of handling more complex legal matters, longer motion and trial practice and increased legal research and writing. Sarah is smart, intellectually curious, patient and possesses an unmatched worth ethic. Cannot think of a more qualified candidate, both in intel in intellect and temperament to serve on the Superior Court judge. <laughs> and um, the last one is from um, Judge Marianne Hinkle. And she talks about how she served, um, she has served for 17 years in the First Justice of the Woburn District Court. And she talks about how you closely work together and um, you quickly became one of the most active and involved members and you developed an online education program. And she talked about how you covered advanced domestic violence issues, orientation programs, and served on the judicial response system. And she wants to say that she, you will be remarkable. She was a remarkable district court judge. Many of us with far more years on the bench than Sarah reach out to her to advice on a regular basis. In years before I joined the bench, I had an opportunity to appear before Superior Court judges. I am truly sorry that if Sarah is confirmed to this position she now seeks, we will lose her extraordinary talent in the district court but I'm confident that Sarah's intelligent judgment, demeanor, com communication skills, remarkable worth ethic, and the passion for the work of a trial court judge will make her an outstanding Associate Justice of the Superior Court. Over the years, Sarah, Sarah and I have become friends. On a personal level, she is kind, compassionate, thoughtful, caring, generous with her time and attention, ethical, and totally devoted to her family. She is, in short, one of the finest people I know. I recommend her to you without reservation. And um, I know a lot of counselors don't read them, but this is important. This is about you, and we have public access, and I want people to know who the governor is appointing and how the council respects you. And um, I'm sorry, I, I want to thank Councilor DePaulo for giving the respect to this nominee. Thank you. And so with that, I thank you all for all your patience. And I'm going to um, adjourn. And next week at our assembly, when the Lieutenant Governor chairs the hearing, I will be very proud to put your name in nomination. And it's been my pleasure. And you have to come back to the diner to get that bells from Waffle. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for coming.